Hello and welcome to another episode of The Power of Story and Science. I'm your host, David Oti, and as you may have heard on this program, we have a mix of content and conversations. And today's episode is going to be a conversation with Amanda Hayes, who is, as of a rather recent uh, development, science officer at a company called Bioagilytics. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you, David. Amanda and I got acquainted through the uh, American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists, and she is a scientist, and she knows that the theme of this program is not just about science, but about how we tell the story of our work, how any technical presenter can engage their audience by telling the story of their work and communicate more effectively. So we've had a brief get us get acquainted discussion, and I'd like Amanda to take it from there and tell us a bit about your your background as a scientist and communicator. Sure. Thank you, David. I really appreciate the invitation to be on the podcast. And so I'm a scientific officer at uh, Bioagilytics, and uh, mainly what I do right now is uh, I'm very client-facing, so I do a lot of um, interactions with clients on the capabilities of what we can do to support their programs. Um, I've been in the CRO industry for almost 10 years now. Uh, so uh, have heavy in the CRO industry and large molecule science. So most of my experience has to do with large molecule uh, support. So that has to do with, you know, biologics and um, different modalities that are uh, constantly changing. Um, so I do a lot of, uh, I've, I've come from the bench, uh, you know, 10 years ago, I started as a bench scientist and kind of moved my way up to where I'm at now. Okay. Okay. So, um, I, I'm not, I spend time around scientists, but I am not a pharmaceutical scientist myself. So for the benefit of me and others, not in your field, when you say, uh, large molecule support or something like that in mm -hmm. plain English, what is that? area of science about? Um, it's anything really that is, could be uh, a biologic, it could be a vaccine, it could be a cell or gene therapy. Um, so not something taken orally typically. Um, so with things like biologics, uh, we have uh, other implications that we have to worry about uh, from a drug perspective or a drug development process perspective. Uh, for example, your immune system uh, can amount a uh, immune response against these types of uh, modalities. Okay. All right. So uh, a very uh, specialized area of pharmaceutical development and one that from what little I know is showing a, a lot of promise for therapies that weren't even really possible uh, until fairly recently. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. Okay. Um, let me take you back uh, a bit further. Uh, what got you interested in science and persuaded you you might want to uh, become a scientist? Was there a, a teacher, a professor, someone else in your life who specifically encouraged that interest for you? That's a great question. So when I was in um, college, Initially, my whole goal was to be a dentist. So I spent a majority of my high school and college years just, um, you know, working towards that goal. And um, while I was in college, I had a professor who, um, he was my, my anatomy and physiology professor. And he asked me if I'd be interested in doing an internship, um, doing research at the University of Kansas Medical Center. Um, and I kind of, was like, ah, I don't know if that's really something I want to do. And he basically said, you know, it'd be good for your dental school application. But more importantly, he felt that I had a little bit more um, to me than just being a dentist. Mm. <laughs> how, how he put it, he, he said, you could have a chance to kind of create um, information and science that dentists and doctors practice. Um, so he, he felt like I had a little bit more in me to, to be something a little bit more than just a dentist. Uh, in his <laughs> opinion. So, um, 
so I applied and I did this internship. It was 10 weeks uh, at the University of Kansas Medical Center. And I absolutely just fell in love with the science, um, creating something that wasn't there before, troubleshooting, solving a puzzle. It just really played to a lot of the interests that I had that I wasn't aware of that my professor in college uh, had seen about me. Had so that's seen. Kind of, yeah. And so I, I pivoted and went straight into a, a PhD program right after that. Okay. Okay. Uh, you were talking about creating something, uh, something new in, in terms of the knowledge and information. And uh, uh, I think you said something about solving the puzzle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's what you found was really more interesting to you than the, than the prospect of of practicing uh, medicine, dentistry, which is a you know a, a science in itself, but rather uh, adding to a field of knowledge that really intrigued you. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you you mentioned that you started out as a, a bench scientist. You were doing the work, doing research, generating data. Mm -hmm. And um, now you are science officer. You've been through some changes in what your focus is. Mm -hmm. So instead of using lab equipment and generating data, you're now doing what exactly? So I'm very much um, client facing and it's almost like being a consultant. Um, to clients who have uh, clinical studies that are ongoing. So they would come to us for advice on, you know, I have this molecule and um, how can your company help us? What should I be thinking about when I'm submitting uh, to the regulatory agencies during the drug development process? What should I be thinking about? And so really it's kind of a consultation uh, on their program. Mm. Um, and then how my company specifically can help support that. So a consultation, someone has done some science, they've got something that is novel and they think it could have an application. And so you're, uh, yes, you're dealing with regulatory processes and things like that, but it almost seems like there's an aspect of what you're describing that involves, um, imagining what the possibilities are for this new thing they've brought you right yes yeah so you know this position really takes somebody who kind of has a pretty vast knowledge in what's been done you know over the last several decades and kind of where the market's going and what's out there um, what's being developed what are uh, companies doing what are what's the new technology that people are using so um, having that knowledge is really key to being able to give that advice to, to customers. I see. So a greater uh, breadth and depth of knowledge, um, not just of the biochemistry involved, but the, the market applications, what other people may already have in development that could um, uh, uh, not knock this opportunity uh, out, you know, because they, they beat you to market with something who would do the same thing. And it sounds right. like there's a lot of different kinds of knowledge that you have to bring together to do what you do. Exactly. Yeah. And, and not to forget the regulatory knowledge too. Right. Um, you know, there are guidances out there on how to do things. And, you know, sometimes there's really no path um, on some of these new, new drugs, these new technologies on how to um, develop this work, how to ensure that you have the right data. Um, so having that knowledge too is really important of, um, you know, what has the, what have the regulatory agencies required? Um, and then where is there more kind of wiggle room or not a whole lot of guidance? Hmm. Okay. Okay. So thinking about this professional journey you've been on from, a bench scientist to science officer and the different, um, not just all the, the knowledge you had to accumulate, but, but the communication skills, the, the skills of being able to talk to your clients and uh, establish that trusted relationship with them. There's, um, there's a lot of different skills involved in that that 
don't necessarily come easily to a lot of people who are trained to use their instruments and generate data. Would you agree? Right. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. What are some of the steps along your journey where you recognize that you had an opportunity to add the requisite skills? Were there people that helped you with that? Yes. Um, I've had, I've been fortunate enough to have uh, really good mentors in this space and um, just listening to them kind of conduct themselves in certain situations really helps me kind of pick up on some of those skills. Um, but that's really how I learned was just by um, kind of following and um, making sure that I always had an opportunity to learn, to, to continually learn, whether it was science or, you know, a professional skill like communication. Um, mm. and, and sometimes those opportunities are not really presented to you. You kind of have to seek them out and kind of take the initiative over what you're trying to, to get out of that. Um, so just seeing my mentors kind of have these kind of skills really gave me the, the opportunity to kind of seek that out and say, okay, this is a skill that I also want to acquire. So I'm going to listen and learn. Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of how it came about. So some of it came about by uh, just observing some people that had the skills you needed. But you said the opportunities don't always come along. You have to take take the initiative. I like that statement. Can you bring to mind a, a particular moment or episode when you remember taking the initiative to find out one of these um more about one of these what we'll call soft skills. I hate that term. <laughs> um, that has really helped you? Yeah. Um, I can recall early on um, just asking my, my, my managers or my mentors for an opportunity to, to sit on, on a call. If it, even if it wasn't my job responsibility at the time, if I was just a bench scientist, I wanted to see how they delivered the data. I wanted to see how they were communicating um, stuff that I was generating in the lab. And so I would just simply ask, can I sit in on this call with you? Um, and that's kind of how it started. And it kind of morphed its way into, um, well, can I speak on the data this time? Mm. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of the, the initiatives that, that they were, you know, small steps to mm -hmm. ultimately just kind of putting myself and practicing, putting myself in those situations and practicing some of those skills. Oh, okay. All right. So it started with, can I sit in on this call? And then moved to, can I present some of the data next time? Mm -hmm. mm, okay. Um, so what, um, you, you've been able to apply that as well in mentoring other scientists. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Tell me, tell me about some of that. Tell me about some of what you've done to help others along in their professional development. Right. Um, you know, great question. So I've had the privilege of being able to manage quite a few people and um, not really just manage, but kind of lead, lead their careers. Um, I don't like the term manager, but more uh, kind of mentor or leader. And mm -hmm. um, so uh, typically what I've done in the past is um, because a lot of scientists don't really know that they have to kind of take that initiative is really starting that initiative for them. So in talking to them about their career development, I always talked about, do you want to be a bench scientist forever or do we want to take the next step? And oftentimes I would just bring them to the, the, the client calls. So I'd, start them out by, okay, I want you to sit in here and uh, listen in on how I'm going to present your data. Mm -hmm. And then it would morph into, okay, at the next call, I'm going to have you present the data. Okay. And then eventually it, they just kind of got comfortable doing that. And it really takes practice. It takes a lot of practice, a lot of listening, being able to digest that information and then giving them the opportunity to kind of craft their own uh, skill when it comes to communicating science. So a lot of it is about the communication aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
there was also, I'm aware of, uh, an earlier stage in your career where, as it happened, you were leading a team that was made up entirely of women scientists. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and is, is that when you uh, had this particular opportunity to help develop some of their communication skills? Yeah, absolutely. I, I kind of started um, giving that opportunity early, a little bit earlier on in my career. And um, when I kind of got to that uh, part of my career where I had the that fabulous team of all female scientists, mm -hmm. uh, yes, that was a, a big part of um, their development. Um, yeah, so when I started, there were a lot of uh, kind of green scientists when it came to communication. Um, but, you know, by the time uh, the years went by, uh, all those scientists were, they took 100% charge of uh, talking about their data. And I always made it a point to, to say, you know, this isn't, um, this isn't really like added responsibility. I wanted them to see it as you generated this data, you should be proud of it. Um, mm. And I, I want you to feel like this is yours and not just me, you know, uh, kind of stealing the, th the thunder. <laughs> mm. Okay. The great work going on. So. Yeah. Pride of ownership and the information. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there, uh, uh, were there particular pre presentation opportunities of, of a formal sort, meetings, uh, association meetings or company wide meetings or something like that? that you steered someone toward who might've been reluctant to take that on initially? Yeah, uh, you know, that happens quite a bit. Scientists are, are a little more introverted. Um, you know, sometimes they like to work uh, kind of alone, but, um, you know, part of being a leader of the group, I really wanted them to, to shine and it kind of goes back to being proud of what you do and being able to share that with the world. Um, so yeah, any chance that we had, we always uh, submitted posters or presentations to national meetings uh, for that recognition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and and can, can you think of someone who used that opportunity in a way that, that really um, helped kind of catapult their, their career forward? Oh, absolutely. They have several. Um, several of them. Yeah. Even from the group of the, the female scientists that uh, I had just a few years ago, several have uh, continued their journey and in, in the science uh, field. And a lot of them are um, associate directors, directors. Um, they're doing a lot of client facing um, aspects of their job that they weren't doing before. A lot of client facing aspects they weren't doing before. Okay. So you can really see uh, the evidence of, of their growth in, in an area that uh, I think we can agree is important for scientists because if people don't know of your work, how is your work going to change the world? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, when you think back on uh, your career and the You've already told me about some of the things that were key to acquiring those skills and sometimes taking the initiative to sit in on a call, start to see how other people with more experience communicated about their work. Mm -hmm. was, there, um, was there some training or mentoring that you wish you had received sooner? Yeah, uh it's it's kind of hard to teach uh, soft skills <laughs> if you will but it's really hard to teach that um, especially in in science um i can remember when i was in graduate school i did have a course that was on presentation and um actually our um our instructor was um not really a scientist himself but he um was more of a I think he was a communications professor of some sort, but um, he actually made us present when we first started um, a presentation that had nothing to do with science. Um, mm -hmm. And he just worked with us on our presentation skills. Um, but 
other than that, that is probably the only time in my career that I've uh, had exposure to something like that. Really? Uh, so do you think um, that's something that is needed in, in more um, scientist training? It's definitely valuable, um, that's for sure. Um, and honestly, I haven't thought of that specific instance for a really long time. <laughs> it just brought up that memory. Um, okay. But yeah, it, it is important. It's important to be able to present the science, um, even if it's not a formal setting, even if it's amongst friends and family, mm -hmm. um, you know, especially with the pandemic uh, going on, I, you know, I'm sure me, just like every other scientist out there, um, are constantly asked, um, is, is this scientifically sound, you know, what the media is putting out? Mm -hmm. So we get those questions and you have to be able to communicate um, your knowledge and what you know about that, uh, even in a non-professional setting. How very true. There's a lot of people uh, questioning scientists about a lot of things that are not, you know, clearly understood outside, uh, outside their lab, so to speak, outside their particular area of expertise. And... Uh, that, I think, sadly leads to a lot of uh, public skepticism about science in general. You know, I, scientists, of course, don't like to speak in absolutes. You know, there's always some other data that might come along that would change your perspective of something. And yet, uh, simplistically stated, the, the, the people, the media audiences are often looking for assurances in the form of something absolute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's a difficult gap, isn't it, for scientists to bridge? It is, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, reflecting on the pandemic situation that we've been in for over a year now as we record this, mm -hmm. how has that changed uh, or added to perhaps the communication challenges around science? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, it's, it's really brought us all together, um, all scientists across the world on how we do things, on how we think about things. Mm -hmm. um, there have been even meetings, um, you know, conferences just on this topic, on how we've come together, how the last couple of years have been um, in light of what's been happening and, um, you know, how we're all kind of helping each other trying to work through the unknowns. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, there's been a lot of collaboration, a lot of, uh, talks. Uh, yeah, it, it's definitely kind of brought people together, uh, in the science industry for sure. Hmm. Okay. I'm glad to hear that. Um, what about just the, the practical aspects of communicating more with, say, virtual audiences instead of getting up in a, in a room with a projector and a screen? Uh, has that required a different set of skills? I think so. Um, it's, it's, it's been different. It definitely has been different, but um, really in a good way. Uh, I think... Previously, virtual communications were, I mean, oftentimes if I was on a, a client call, for example, we never really turned our cameras on. Um, it wasn't until uh, during and post-pandemic where everybody uh, started kind of ensuring that cameras were turned on because it you can see the other person mm -hmm. and it's, it's really normalized some of that, <laughs> how we do uh, teleconferences these days. Mm. Um, so, yeah, l little things like that. Yeah, um, yeah, mm -hmm. little things uh, like, I guess, you know, being able to collaborate across greater distances with, with less hassle and, mm -hmm. and travel time and expense, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm gonna, I challenged you with something a little while ago, gave you a little prep time. 
Um, some of my audience will recall that I've interviewed Randy Olson, the marine biologist turned filmmaker who has a lot of good ideas on how people can communicate their science more effectively, in particular the what he calls the ABT or and but therefore template. And I'll give uh, an example of that. Um, I have long had an interest in both storytelling and science, and I have spoken about that intersection to a variety of audiences, but I wanted to reach a broader audience who might not encounter me in person. Therefore, I decided to start this podcast. So in, in three linked statements, fairly concisely, that gives me an opportunity to explain the, the genesis of this podcast. So, uh, Amanda, I've asked you if you can use that same structure, that, uh, that and but therefore, uh, to describe the, the story of your work. Okay, I'm going to try to give this a shot. Okay. Um, all right, so I have a passion for creating science, for troubleshooting and optimizing um, assays. And uh, I enjoy speaking about uh, these things. And with uh, the ever-changing industry in science right now, with different drug modalities, different technologies that are available, um, uh, I enjoy doing that, but um, you know, there's not always a clear path on how to um, support these different drug modalities and how to use this technology for uh, moving drugs down the pipeline. And therefore, I am currently in my position of a scientific officer where I can hopefully try to help uh, to achieve that. Okay, bravo. I, I believe you did a terrific job with that. Um, because the, the, the and statements let us find out about your, your passions, the, the, the but, the slight contradiction that comes in there um, helps us see where something might be missing or challenging and therefore gives us an idea of the direction you're going. So congratulations on, on doing that. I think that was very well stated. <laughs> it was a little difficult. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, it, it, can be, it can be difficult. I think it's uh, tremendously useful as well. I think it, mm -hmm. it challenges some of us who want to go into a lot of uh, detail to wrap our information in a fairly concise package with that. So... Uh, that helped me understand more of the how the how your passion for science led you to what you're doing now. So thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, this is uh, uh, David Odie speaking with Amanda Hayes. In case you lost track of that, and uh, Amanda has uh, been on a, a career arc that has led her to being currently the science officer of bioagilitics. Did I say that correctly? Yes. Okay. Um, and we've heard something about what that means. Um, and we've heard about the importance of adding communication skills to your lab skills if you really want to develop professionally as a scientist. So, uh, Amanda, is there a one pithy bit of advice you would give someone who may be at a, a point in their career where you were at some previous time uh, and mm -hmm. is looking to advance. Uh, what, what's the one thing you'd want my audience to know? I would say definitely take advantage of the opportunities that are out there. They won't, will not always be presented to you. Um, so always seek them out. Um, take the initiative uh, to, to learn as much as you can from mentors, from colleagues, um, that will set you up for tremendous success. And, you know, in the science community, everybody's willing to help. Everybody's willing to, to lend a hand and teach um, and mentor. So uh, seek those people out and, and take the initiative. And that's my 
best piece of advice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Take the initiative, seek people out that can mentor you and, and help you along. Uh, that, that sounds like great advice and uh, certainly something from your lived experience. So thank you for sharing that with us. As we come to the conclusion of our program here, uh, Amanda, is there something you would uh, like to leave us with in terms of how we can follow up with you or your company or learn more about your work? Oh, sure. Um, uh, my email address, um, did you want me to give it? If you, if you choose to that sure. or company URL, whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah. So my email is amanda.hayes, uh, without an E, at biodolytics.com. Uh, um, yeah. And uh, please feel free to reach out to me with, with any questions. I, I will say I do get a lot of uh, people reach out for opportunities to mentor them. I'm happy to do that for, for anybody out there who's listening. Oh, how wonderful. Thank you for extending that offer. I bet that's going to be really helpful to someone. Well, Amanda Hayes, thank you for having this conversation with me. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank and you very much. You're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, if anyone wants to follow up with me uh, with a comment or question on the program or a suggestion for future interview guests, the easiest way to do that would be to go to storyandscience.com storyandscience.com will take you to the home page of this program and from there you can learn more about what we do and how to contact us so as always thank you for being a part of the story and science community <music>